So the first thing I did was get my flow-through model set up and just run it to a steady hydraulic condition that I would use as my starting point for rock scour. So rock scour can read in a initial restart as your initial um, hydraulic condition for the, the rock scour calculations. So that's what it looked like in Flow3D. As we mentioned, you're defining, I guess, this green component in Flow3D. That is what can scour. So in rock scour, we're also defining that extent. And these are the, I guess, the objects that'll be updated throughout the, the coupling process. And so with the outputs that you can get I guess I piece this together in um, Flow3D post. So if you've used Flow3D before, the, the output you get is still just a normal um, you know, Flow3D output file. The difference is that bed is going to be different with each iteration. So you can see how the scour evolves. And generally, I would run this until it looked like um, an equilibrium was, was pretty much reached. Hello, and welcome to today's Australian Water School webinar covering fluid solid coupling with Flow 3D Hydro and Rock Scour. I am your host, Cray Price, with the International Water Training Institute. We are excited to bring you some fantastic content today that really pushes the limits, uh, puts you on the cutting edge of what's possible now with recent advances in hardware and software. So let's welcome, first of all, our global audience. This is truly a global audience spread around. You'll see from not just the attendees, but the presenters as well, coming to you from all corners of the globe. Welcome today, many, many attendees from around the world. We hope you enjoy the content. We've got uh, Eric and Eric. We'll call them Eric L. and Eric B. today as our presenters. They'll be tag teaming back and forth. Uh, Brian Fox will be our panelist uh, answering your questions in the background. Let's hear from you. Let us know where you're coming to us from today and how long you've been in this uh, CFD business. Uh, maybe first, tell us what CFD stands for. Eric L., over to you first. Yeah, so the big one, uh, computational fluid dynamics. Um, so I'm with uh, Flow Science Australasia, um, and we are the distributor for Flow3D, which is a CFD software. I'm based in Brisbane, and I've been using Flow3D for, well, I'd say, about 16 years now. So I'm supposed to be maybe an, an expert, but um, I wouldn't call myself that, but happy to be here. All right. Well, thanks. Um, and uh, I think uh, Eric came up with our original title that we've had in some of our promotional materials, which is for those about to rock scour, we compute you. We wanted to put in the uh, YouTube title in today's presentation title, a little more technical content on what you're actually going to see, but in true Aussie fashion with our um, uh ACDC uh, little uh, reference there. Um, that's what we've used. So if you see that, that's uh, in any other materials. That's the same presentation. Now across uh, one of the other ponds over to Eric B. Let's hear from you. Let us know where you're coming to us from. And uh, yeah, how and, and let us know also how the two companies are interrelated that we see there um, in the title. Yeah, thank you. So I'm from uh, Lausanne, Switzerland. So for me, it's in the middle of the night now. <laughs> It's a tough one. Uh, I've been working for almost 30 years in hydraulic engineering and, well, let's say some 25 years of these in, in rock scour specifically, which was the topic of my PhD at the time. And over the last few years, I've been developing uh, digitalization of the field of rock scour, and that's what we will speak about uh, later on today. Uh, right. Well, thanks for that. We look forward to hearing from you in your presentation. Brian, uh, we've heard from you in a previous webinar. Uh, maybe uh, make a little plug for what you told us before, and um, we'll include some links to that webinar, and then let us know what you've been up to in the meantime. Uh, yeah, uh, so Brian Fox, I'm based out of Denver, Colorado, uh, working here with uh, Flow3D, so I uh, support our, our users in civil hydraulics and all uh, different ways. Uh, but yeah, we part of a webinar several years back, um, I didn't create the other or we're putting the, the link to it uh, somewhere in the chat, but just about um, you know, 3D modeling. Um, so today I'll be answering questions in the chat and uh, um, yeah, helping, helping these guys wherever it comes up. Excellent. Well, thanks for that. Um, if we can have the poll results up here, let's just have a look at um, what the background is for our audience. Um, and then maybe we'll have uh, Eric L. Maybe you can speak to this and see if you, um, as, as you guys are sharing your screens, um, just let us know if you see any surprises there. It looks like most, actually a greater uh, <laughs> greater than half have performed scour assessments before. So that's uh, that's great. We've got a lot of hydraulic engineers on board. 
And um, many of the presenters, almost 80%, or many of the attendees, almost 80%, have worked on Scour projects before, perhaps not in CFD. Um, maybe they have. It looks like uh, the minority have actually used CFD, um, but the majority have done Scour. So uh, what does that uh, tell you about the audience, uh, Eric L.? Yeah, no, it's um, it's good to see. I know my background, I did a lot of bridge scour assessments, so I know it's it's kind of a common thing we have to do as hydraulic engineers. Um, but no, I think, uh, honestly, 80% and 60%, that's probably maybe a little higher than I was expecting, but it's good to see. Yeah. No, that's that's great. Um, and just to, to remind everybody, this is a, um, a sponsored webinar by Flow3D and Rockscour, and uh, you'll hear a little bit more about those products. But we are also uh, talking today about some really cool co technical content that does push the edge on what you can do. Now, if you want to do something practical with Scour assessments, we will get into 1D and 2D Scour assessment in our June Australian Water School Bridge Scour course. We'll include links in the YouTube description and uh, in the uh, chat line here uh, for some of that. And that will introduce some things where you may want to try this in CFD as well with some bridge scour. Today, we're talking about rock scour, though. I can see your screen just fine. I'm going to drop into the background. Um, Eric and Eric will do the presentation. Uh, and then we'll have Brian in the background answering your questions. Do keep the questions coming early because a lot of times what happens, we get a flood of questions right at the end and we don't have time to address them. So uh, from the to the audience members and to those attendees out there um, who want to know a little more about this, get those questions in early. We'll try to answer them in the chat line, and then we will answer some of them live, uh, the ones that are upvoted the most. So with that, uh, Brian and I will back into the background, um, turn our cameras off. We'll be back with you after the presentation for a live panel discussion. Looking forward to it. Over to you. All right. Thanks, Craig. Um, let's get started. So as I said, uh, I work for Flow Science uh, Australasia. Um, so Flow Science is based in the U.S. and they develop uh, Flow 3D, which is a CFD software. Flow Science Australasia um, is the distributor for this software in Australia and New Zealand. Um, as I mentioned, I'm based in Brisbane. And prior to joining, joining um, Flow Science, I worked in civil engineering as a consultant. Um, and I was fortunate enough to have Flow 3D is one of the tools that I used um, as as an engineer. Um, and we're very fortunate to have Brian spend his nighttime uh, helping us out with the, the Q&A. Brian's based in, in Denver. Um, you may recognize him from some other Flow 3D webinars over the years. And Eric... Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Again? Yeah, maybe if you could. Yeah, I, so I'm um, yeah working in Lausanne, Switzerland at AquaVision Engineering. So we are developers and distributors worldwide for the Rockscaro software that you will uh, discover later on. Um, and uh, while well, that that that's about it, I think uh, for the moment. Uh, right. So today's agenda. Um, We'll give you a, an overview of Flow3D Hydro. Eric will give you an overview of the, the Rock Scour platform, the fluid solid coupling approach, which is what we're here to discuss today. We'll get into an example um, at an Aus Australian dam, show you how this works. Um, if we have time, we'll, we'll cover a few more examples. Um, and we'll try to jump in with the Q&A before uh, the end of the hour. Um, we know some of you have to leave after that. Um, so just... As we start the webinar, just keep in mind how this is going to work. We have one half of it is the hydraulic simulation, um, which is going to be done in Flow 3D Hydro. So it's a 3D CFD software. That's going to interact with a rock scour platform um, that Eric will talk about. And so just simply how this works is it's an iterative process that passes hydraulic data to rock scour to do the rock scour calculations. That then feeds back um, a new geometry of the bed based on what erosion has taken place. So this iteration um, will keep keep going to give you an idea of what scour happens um, over, I guess the the site that you're you're analyzing. So this is this is kind of what we're working towards today. So the first piece of that is the flow three hydro, um, and I guess to give some context for for this whole presentation, as as water engineers or However, you're involved in the industry, if you work for a council or an asset owner, we all have some common challenges that we face. Um, you know, we have aging infrastructure, um, 
that needs to be updated, renewed, replaced. And probably with the, the added difficulty of not having enough uh, funds to, to do all the replacements we need to do. Climate change is putting pressure on these assets. Um, you know, our extreme flows happen more frequently, um, as we all know. Managing water resources, uh, especially in Australia, where, you know, we range from extreme droughts to extreme floods and everywhere in between. Um, so, you know, managing these, this resource is very important. Mitigating risks, trying to, you know, be more efficient with our operations, complying with regulations. Um, you know, these are all things that we have to address when we're designing new structures, um, trying to improve existing ones. So we have, you know, we're often trying to a answer a question, will this design solve the problem we're looking at? Um, you know, is this structure going to be at risk? Um, so we have tools available to us, you know, design guidelines, um, textbooks, other industry papers. Um, one of our tools now um, that's, I think, come a long way, in, in especially in, in recent years, is numerical modeling and speci specifically uh, 3D CFD modeling. So it's a tool for us as engineers to help us make decisions. Um, obviously, you still have to exercise your engineering judgment. Um, and so what is CFD? Well, it's a, it's a simulation tool. It gives us three-dimensional outputs that's uh, very accurate, detailed, and also dynamic. So this is just an example of, you know, a physical model, a drop shaft um, done in the Iowa lab compared to a flow 3D model on the right. So very dynamic um, modeling outputs, uh, three-dimensional, um, you know, high-resolution detail. So this is what we're talking about um, when we're talking about CFD. And so one of the key takeaways is, um, you know, CFD gives us the ability to model our built environment at a, you know, a one-to-one -one scale. So we're doing full-scale modeling and very detailed um, models. So just a few examples from, from some of our users, you know, designing um, ship locks, um, a gated spillway, um, kind of similar to one of the examples we'll have today, um, a failed spillway uh, that I think we've seen before. Another spillway, uh, some type of inlet, and then an Australian one looking at some fishways. Um, so these are all examples of, you know, high resolution, full scale models um, that you're able to do in CFD. And I wanted to highlight this one because um, you may have seen this before. I think this was back in 2017 is when it happened. Um, so a spillway failure, I guess it relates to our, our presentation today because it was a scour issue. Um, one of our users, Northwest Hydraulic Consultants, they were brought in to do the post-failure analysis. So they were look, looking at more of the, um, using CFD to design the repairs and emergency spillways. Um, there's a link there if you want to explore it. But I thought this was a good one to highlight because it shows, you know, the power of erosion and it shows the high uh, level of detail that we're able to get in a 3D CFD model. And another way we think about CFD is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a virtual lab for us. Um, it used to be when you wanted this type of 3D output, um, you needed a physical model. Um, so this old model that was done, uh, shown on the left. Um, we're fortunate in Australia, we've got a few great physical modeling facilities. Um, physical modeling is still very important. Um, but we also have this this tool, this ability to do 3D modeling in in a numerical setting. So these next couple slides, um, actually Brian was involved in this. It was taking an old um, U.S. Army Corps model, building it in CFD, and checking the results. And so the first thing was just to look at um, developing a head discharge rating curve uh, based on different gate openings, um, and you can see the physical modeling and the CFD modeling results um, compare quite well. And then the next one was to look at um, pressures on the spillway crest. So again, we had measurements in the physical model. We were able to compare that to CFD, and it matches up quite well. So again, it's just another tool available to us to do these detailed assessments. So how does it work? To put it 
quite simply, um, we're solving the Navier-Stokes equations in three dimensions. An important input is going to be your, your 3D representation of your structures. Um, so you'll need your 3D CAD, import that into Flow 3D. You apply a, a computational mesh to that. Um, in Flow 3D, it's quite simple because we use a structured mesh. Uh, but that's going to break up your, your model into different um, individual control volumes that you'll solve these equations and get these outputs. So very simple, oversimplified explanation. So I'm sure a lot of you who are here have some background in modeling. You've probably used 1D and 2D tools. Um, you know, we're all still using the same equations to as part of these, these models. So it's um, you know, adding that third dimension, I mean, basically all you're doing is, you know, in a 1D model, you have cross-sectional averaging, 2D model is depth averaging, a 3D model, you're solving each dimension. So it's, you know, even though obviously I'm biased, I work for a 3D um, CFD solver, there are still applications where all of these are going to be the best tool to use. Um, it's just good to have, and I was fortunate to have as, as a consultant, I had access to all these tools and, um, you know, using the correct tool to solve whatever you need for your, your problem is, is extremely valuable. But the point we want to make is it's, it's, it's not magic. It's still solving the same equations as, as your other models. So it's a brief overview of, of Flow 3D. We've been around for almost 40 years as a, as a general purpose CFD solver. So meaning we serve a lot of different industries, um, the thing we really focus on is the ability to capture a complex free surface. Um, so as it relates to water applications, we're usually talking about modeling that interface between water and air. So this video um, that's playing now, you can see that's a very complex um, shape to be captured. The way we do it is you don't have to model the movement of air above the water. So computationally um, more efficient. We track that surface and apply a boundary condition to it. So we're a little bit different um, than some other CFD options. But that's really what we specialize in. Um, today, we're talking about coupling that with an external physics um, option. Within Flow 3D, there are some other physics you can incorporate as well. Um, so we have sediment transport to look at more you know, sediment or sandy soil scour. Um, so there's bridge scour there at the top. We have uh, non-Newtonian capabilities, so um, you can do tailings and also tailings mixed with water, so different, um, I guess, more complex tailings modeling. And even though um, I just said we don't typically model the air phase above the water, you can still look at air entrainment. Um, and air entrainment would dissolve gas, so there's still ways to handle that. Moving objects, so we can do, you know, as exists, this example shows, um, you know, full coupled motion, six degree of freedom. You can also do moving gates, mixers. Um, it's very flexible with with how you can handle moving ob objects. And we also have the ability to combine it with a two-dimensional mesh block within the same domain. Um, obviously, our, our focus is going to be 3D modeling, but there are cases where you want to extend your model further upstream or downstream or both. And to do that with a full 3D grid would be very computationally intensive. Um, so in this case, we're looking at 3D spillway, but we want to get that approach flow captured. We can do that in a 2D mesh block um, without taking up as much computa computational resources. And so without getting into too much of this, I mean, we have... Flow 3D Hydro is set up to focus on, um, you know, water applications. So we have streamlined um, workflows, examples, um, training materials. And we have people on our tech support, like Brian and myself, who have worked in the industry. Um, so we're really focused on trying to support the, the, water, the water market. So we won't go into all of these, but, you know, these are where we have people using our software throughout the world. Um, today, we're probably mostly focused on dams. Um, 
Eric does have an example at the end that's related to a bridge. Um, but yeah, this is obviously we don't have time to go into detail for all these, but we're used in, in a bunch of different industries in civil engineering. So when would you use um, CFD when you need um, more accuracy? It's a very versatile tool. Um, this example we're looking at on the right is looking at some baffle block dissipation. If you needed to test different, you know, baffle block arrangements, it's as easy as just switching out the, the 3D CAD. If you need to test different boundary conditions, it's just change a few numbers and rerun. So it's very flexible, very versatile. When you have complex, um, you know, physics, and, and obviously the first question I usually ask is, is your problem really a three-dimensional problem? Um, if it's not, then maybe you shouldn't be using CFD. And really a key is... Um, you know, thinking back to my work as a consultant, a lot of my CFD modeling was used to supplement additional physical modeling or other 1D and 2D models. Models where you have a location that's maybe not so standard or it's just kind of a, a very important area to get right, we would model that in CFD, kind of plug those in to feed our other models. So helps you reduce design uncertainty. And of course, the the outputs, um, you know, both when dealing with technical and non-technical stakeholders, um, dealing with, I guess, showing them 3D plots and all the detailed outputs you can get. It's a very effective communication tool. And so on our website, we have some more, um, you know, webinars and papers and things you can access. We're not really getting into a lot of detail today on CFD. There are also a couple other... Um, water school webinars related to 3D modeling. And the final point is if you're interested in training or learning more about this, um, that's part of my job. So just reach out to me. Um, be happy to, to help you out with that. And so now tying it into um, why we're here. So why would you use Flow3D for the rock scour coupling? I think the main thing is it gives you 3D detailed 3D outputs to use in the rock scour calculations. As I mentioned, our, our one fluid, um, volume of fluid modeling approach for capturing that free surface, it's computationally efficient. So to do the iterations, um, just to give you a reference, the dam example that we look, go, look at today, that was done on my laptop. So it's not, um, you know, it doesn't require a, an HPC cluster or anything like that. Obviously, the more power you have, the faster your models will run. Um, and a key point, which we'll get into when we talk about the coupling, is when we're passing geometry back and forth, the mesh doesn't need to change. So the mesh automatically picks up on the new geometry. Um, so that's very helpful when we're talking about coupling. And we already have a lot of users in this industry. Um, so for them to pick up this coupling approach... Um, Hopefully is a is an easy step for them. So that's it for me um, for now. Um, pass it over to Eric to talk about rock scour. Sorry, yeah, thank you, Eric. Uh, so uh, the second part of the presentation, the webinar, will uh, deal with an currently ongoing process of uh, digitalization of the field of rock scour engineering. So this is something I've been working on over the last four years now, and that resulted in the development of uh, the Roxcara uh, cloud-based uh, digital environment. Um, let's... I hope it is all working. Start with a video of... A uh, significant flood event that occurred on a dam uh, upstream of Risbon in Australia, and that gave uh, significant damage, uh, as you can see on the upper pictures and the unlined rock downstream, where you have uh, blocks as big as a bus, 10 or 15 meter side length that have been ejected from that pool towards downstream. And uh, you can see also in the lower uh, right-hand side, a machine working in a scar hole of another dam uh, just uh, downstream of the concrete uh, apron. So with this nice picture of the uh, 
dried scarrow at Kariba Dam in Zimbabwe. Uh, if we set the scene on, on rock scarrow today, then we know we have climate change, we have changing flood statistics. Uh, so we have scarrow generating floods that occur more and more frequently. And the problem is that uh, a lot of our spillways uh, are aging and we do not really have a good idea about how they would react during uh, such scar generating events. So as we know that scar may potentially threaten dam safety, uh, it becomes more and more obvious that dam owners and operators need to implement rock scar into dam safety and specifically into real-time risk-informed decision-making processes. Um, if we take a quick look at the history of computational methods in uh, rock scour over the last uh, century, let's say, that starts, of course, with a large number of empirical equations. There are a number of semi-empirical methods that have been developed. Uh, there is kinematic block analysis, more physics-based approaches like uh, peeling off of blocks. There is fracture mechanics that has been developed. There is physical modeling since a long time. Over the last 20 years, let's say there is 3D CFD that developed with or without air entrainment. And over the last few years, we have some attempts of fluid-solid uh, coupling. Uh, the main point uh, to make here is that actually the latest methods, they become more and more complex and they are only being used by the people that develop them, by the experts. And while well, that's an issue for our engineering community, because often this means that there is almost no feedback from practice back into our community and our profession. And that's a problem. So what we would need is, first of all, a standardization of computational methods and their parameters, uh, together with an accessible database of case studies of SCAR, and finally, customizable digitalized methods that become accessible and applicable by any professional engineer in the field and not just a specialist. This would generate large-scale uh, feedback. We're speaking here about modeling pertinence. The main physics should be included, of course. Uh, phase coupling between air, water, and rock. The computations should be easy, easily and universally accessible. Uh, they should be able to implement the most pertinent computational methods that are available. Should be updatable, allow integration into decision-making processes. And finally, uh, come uh, to data-driven intelligence. So we're speaking here about parameter definition, refinement, and finally, a standardization of the field. So our digital answer to this is called RockScour. So RockScour is a cloud-based digital environment that actually houses two digital platforms, Explore and Exchange. Explore is a cloud-based software platform for SCAR computations, and Exchange is its sister platform. It's a cloud-based database platform for cases. And if we take a closer look at the Rockscar environment and we see that it actually uh, proposes a family of SCAR modules. Uh, you can see here PropScar, for example, for Monte Carlo probabilistic computations. Remote SCAR is uh, an API, an application programming interface that connects Rockscar to Flow3D. We will speak about this later on today. TwinScar is a digital twin real-time application of RockScar computations and CheckScar is a 1D a freely available approach online uh, for plunging jets. Uh, the database is currently under development and will distinguish between different kinds of hydraulic situations as you can see there. And well, what's relevant to state here is that the topology or the structure of the cases will be exactly the same as on the software platform which means that you can easily switch your cases from one platform to the other. If you want to take something on the database to do benchmarking, you can do that on the software platform. Or if you have a project that has been done, finished, and you want to make that public, you can put that also on the, the database. Uh, the methods, I have no time to enter into detail, but uh, there are quite some methods in here. And this list is not final. It, it is continuously under development. Uh, we have erodibility index method, for example, block uplift methods, several ones. Uh, we have fracture mechanics, which gives you the time evolution. And um, 
What's relevant here is that uh, for these methods, uh, the main parameters are clearly described in a user manual and a technical manual, and also the range of values that you should use for each parameter are clearly outlined. Um, from the topological point of view, Rockscar on its own is a 2D software. It works in vertical 2D profiles, as you can see there. And within each profile, there is an in-house hydraulics module for plunging jets that automatically computes all the hydraulic parameters like dynamic pressures, flow velocities, uh, shear stress, stream power, and so on at the water rock interface, but also with uh, increasing depth into the rock. As you can see here in red, the heat map of the intensity of dynamic pressures uh, generated by an impacting uh, jet. If you have other turbulent flows, then you can still use Rockscara, but through a generic exchange uh, file that is used as input, and the hydraulic input for that exchange file can be uh, provided by any uh, hydraulic software like Hackras or Flow3D or uh, you can use whatever software as input. And underneath all this is a 2D rock mass model with depth where you can define as many lithologies as you wish, each with their own geomechanical characteristics. Uh, from the physics point of view, air increment is included based on constitutive equations or directly through the CFD if you couple it with Flow3D. Uh, we already spoke about the hydraulics. And then we have three main uh, breakup mechanisms for rock. The first one, the most important one, is fracture mechanics, which is looking at uh, uh, progressive uh, propagation of uh, joints, formation of joints around blocks. And this gives you the time evolution of scar formation. Second, based on a force balance on prismatic shaped blocks, we can establish rigid body dynamics to check the uplift, dynamic uplift of uh, blocks. And then finally, based on uh, wall jet velocities at the water rock interface, we can establish uh, quasi-steady hydrodynamic lift forces that um, generate um, peeling off of blocks. Uh, let's jump onto the cloud now for a few seconds and we take a, a project within a list of projects. You will see that on the left-hand side, you have the menu with geometry flow and rock parts. In the geometry, you define your 2D profiles with their grid coordinates, first of all. Then you have the initial water rock interface, can be introduced very easily with a CSV file, the scout water interface for uh, calibration, and underneath the rock mass with its own numerical grid, where you can uh, play with the cubes and define the uh, rock lithologies. In the rock part, you have here, for example, a sandstone with its uh, geomechanical characteristics uh, to be uh, defined. And then the last part to define is the flow part where you have spillways. And for each spillway, you have, first of all, for plunging jets, a certain number of general uh, uh, parameters like the initial turbulence intensity, air damping, uh, core jet length factor, and so on. And then you can define blocks of constant discharge and a certain time duration. And you can uh, define as many as you, you wish. And Rockscar will put them through consecutively to model a hydrograph. The computations, we see here a list of computations you can define in the parameters which are the methods that you want to use. For each one, you can click on it and then say yes or no, I want to use it. And you can see the customizable parameters underneath. And the results come, first of all, graphically. For each curve, there is a method. And for the fracture mechanics, you can see here for that float event uh, from the start to the end of the float event, how that video shows you the progressive scour formation in 2D and the rock. And you can check that with the gray dotted line, which is the observed scour after the event. Okay, enough theory now. Let's apply this stuff. And for this, we chose uh, Chuka's Dam in Costa Rica. It's a 63 meter high concrete gravity dam, has been constructed in 2016, has a ski jump spillway. And while I guess they just got bad luck because one year after construction in 2017, they got a 100 year uh, flood event on their spillway. And this looks a little bit like this. So you can see we have significant uh, uh, scar that formed. There was a 25 meter deep scar hole that was generated in 24 hours. Uh, that was a five meters deeper than the worst case scenario that was predicted by the physical modeling in the laboratory. 
So we numerically reproduce this in rock scour using different uh, methods, as you can see uh, here. And then for the fracture mechanics, we have some initial brittle fracturing. And then during that 24 hours duration, we can see how progressively rock scour is able to reconstitute in two dimensions the scour hole that was measured, which is the dotted gray uh, line. So we're not let it end. We go on. Um, let's go one step uh, further now in our process of digital transformation of uh, rock scour engineering by uh, proposing you a, a fluid solid uh, coupling in three dimensions. And for this, we make use of uh, an API that is called a remote scour. So an application programming interface that will connect rock scour to uh, flow 3D. Uh, what you would, you, you would need for this is, first of all, a subscription uh, from AquaVision Engineering of RockScar and Remote Scar uh, modules, and second, a valid Flow3D Hydro license. And then you will uh, obtain automatically from us a customized uh, Flow3D uh, solver, which allows you to generate the output that is taken by Remote Scar and sent to uh, RockScar. Uh, how does it work? Uh, Eric already uh, said a few words about this. It's very simple, actually. We have uh, a first computation in a flow 3D of the hydraulics in three dimensions. And then at the end of a run, flow 3D will define the main hydraulic parameters at the water rock interface, uh, send this uh, through a, a exchange file uh, to ro remote scour that will send it to rock scour and then rock scour will start scouring but layer per layer or hour per hour depending on the module that you use. When there is a partially scoured bottom that will then be sent back by remote scour to Flow3D which is actually in standby and uh, through a new STL file, a new bottom that is inserted, Flow3D will then do a restart and update the previous iteration hydraulics, compute the new hydraulics and so on, send it back to rock scour. So we get back and forth, sequentially, actually, a scour formation until an equilibrium situation is obtained. Uh, it's important to state here also that during these iterations, there is no uh, remeshing that is required, so uh, everything is resolved by the same mesh. Uh, we see here some examples running. Actually, anything you can imagine doing in Flow3D can be used as a coupling with rock scour. We have here a, a high velocity jet coming from a bottom outlet into an unlined rock mass downstream. And here we have flow around a bridge pier in a river founded on the rock. Uh, the connection is uh, pretty fast, as we will see later on some examples. You can use uh, whatever uh, computational method that uh, is available in rock scour in 2D or 3D. And it comes with its own user interface where you can put the main parameters for both rock scour and flow 3d uh, so you have to set up actually first of all your hydraulic model in flow 3d like any project you're doing classically in flow 3d hydro uh, then you have to prepare uh, the prep and file hydraulic model input file for the coupling uh, and set up your rock scour project inside rock scour and then we will use the remote scour interface to uh, start launching the uh, the coupling uh, during the computations, it's important to know that you can uh, check during the, the runs uh, what's the situation both in rock scour based on the uh, 2D and 3D results and also in Flow3D. You can put the results of each iteration during the runs in Flow3D to check if, well, the hydraulics are what you expected. You can see this here, for example, we have the the um, uh, remote scour interface with rock scour uh, parameters, Flow3D parameters, uh, the restart times, the name of the project, the number of iterations, and so on. Flow3D is actually running on your local PC in batch mode, while Rockscar is running on the cloud, actually. And then um, during the uh, connection, the coupling, we have uh, a lock uh, window here and in the interface where you get the information uh, continuously on who is doing what. For example, is Flow3D is running an iteration? Uh, sending the results to Rockscar, for example, that pulls to the cloud, is doing its job, uh, waiting on the feedback from the cloud, then the cloud will send back a new STL file to Flow3D, 
which will uh, unzip it and successfully start a second iteration. So you can follow continuously what is going on during that process. Um, Eric will now uh, start or continue with an example uh, of this coupling uh, in three dimensions on an Australian uh, dam. Okay, so now we've um, talked about how this works. Let's uh, let's actually try it at a real site. So we're looking at this uh, gated spillway, um, and maybe for a little context. So we we wanted to do a, a Flow 3D webinar this year with the Australian Water School. I've heard Eric talk about this coupling approach, but I've never actually tried it myself. Um, so we arranged. Uh, a date to do this webinar before I had actually used the coupling. So the pressure was on. Um, I had some basic training from Eric um, with another one of our Australian users. And then, so this is my first uh, coupling project. I think I need to get that out of the way. Um, the dam details. So it's a gated spillway with a ski jump dissipator. It has an unlined plunge pool. And its capacity now to pass flow is much greater than than what that plunge pool was designed for. So for some background, this dam experienced a, a big flood that exceeded that design capacity. Some scour of the plunge pool was observed. Um, I guess this was before my time in Australia, but I don't think the dam itself was ever under any threat. I think it was just some um, scour of the downstream section. Eric had um, previously done a paper on the same dam, just looking at a simplified 2D um, coupled model, so just along a cross section. So we thought, well, this would be a good example for, for my first venture into trying a, a 3D coupled model. So just to, to apply some, some context, um, I know for me, as someone who used to do a lot of modeling, you kind of lose a sense of scale when you're just looking at drawings and your your model outputs. So just a few photos of the of the cleanup after. I mean you can see the the people standing on those boulders and you know the size of the the equipment there in relation to the spillway. I mean it's a you know it kind of reminds you of how powerful water can be and the, the objects that it's that was able to move during this event. Um so a few disclaimers. Um we used the plunge pool that was based on some design drawings that we had, and the downstream channel is more of a simplified kind of ideal, um, just flat channel. We just looked at the peak flow condition. Um, as Eric was mentioning, you know there are ways we can look at different parts of the hydrograph and kind of piece it all together. To keep it simple, we just looked at the peak event. We're using you know simplified rock properties for the entire plunge pool. Um, this is a little foreshadowing, but we're not accounting for rock mounting that occurred on a downstream section, but I guess just keep that in mind. So as part of the coupling, you define the area that is going to be able to scour. So we're really just, and we'll show it on um, a few slides here. We've just focused on this plunge pool area. And this was not a, a detailed study. This was us kind of working um, nights and weekends outside of our, our day job. And the way I see it, it was just kind of... Um, you know, as I mentioned, it was my first attempt at the coupling. So, you know, I'm certainly not a rock scour expert. So it was more, let's set up the model kind of out of the box and let's see what happens. Um, you know, it wasn't a very detailed, we didn't play with a bunch of calibration parameters or, or anything like that. So to give you an idea of the condition we modeled, um, just fixed upstream and downstream water levels. Um, I adjusted the gate position just to try to match that peak flow that occurred. And won't really get into this in too much detail other than to say that the Flow 3D model we set up was meant to be relatively coarse, um, wanted something to run quickly. And I know on my laptop, you know, I can do a few million cells um, in a reasonable time. So the total number of cells in the Flow 3D model was about one and a half million. And I didn't take a close look at it, but generally each iteration passing back and forth between Flow 3D and Rock Scour took about five to 10 minutes. Um, I was still kind of using my laptop for other things, um, but generally in that in that time frame. So the first thing I did was get my Flow 3 model set up and just run it to a steady hydraulic condition that I would use 
as my starting point for Rock Scour. So Rock Scour can read in a initial restart as your initial um, hydraulic condition for the, the Rock Scour calculations. So that's what it looked like in Flow 3D. As we mentioned, you're defining, I guess, this green component in Flow 3D. That is what can scour. So in Rock Scour, we're also defining that extent. And these are the, I guess, the objects that'll be updated throughout the, the coupling process. I'm going into these details. Um, the the rock characteristics I just took, I think, from Eric's previous paper. Um, and as Eric mentioned, there are multiple different um, scour methodologies you can use. Um, I used one of the ones that had his name in it. I thought that would be a good starting point. Um, and so with the outputs that you can get, I guess I pieced this together in um, both 3D post. So if you've used Flow3D before, the, the output you get is still just a normal um, you know, Flow3D output file. The difference is that bed is going to be different with each iteration. So you can see how the scour evolves. And generally, I would run this until it looked like um, an equilibrium was, was pretty much reached. So that's a pretty video of the output. Now let's, um, I guess, dial into some of the details. How does this compare? Um, so just as a simple comparison... I took three profiles along the middle gates, and let's use this to compare our results. So on the plot, we've got the the green line is our initial bed in Flow 3D. The blue line is what it scoured to, and the black line was um, a survey that was done after the event. And I'm pretty sure this was the first one I checked, and I didn't believe the results because it looks too... Um, too close. I mean, this is pretty pretty accurate. Um, so I figured I made a mistake. Um, but no, if you're a crafty modeler, you would just show this plot to your client and say, um, you know what you're doing. Um, but we're a little more transparent than that. So let's um, look at the other profiles. So this is along the center gate. Um, to me, I still think this looks pretty good. You can see down around the like 100 to 120 meter downstream end we're not quite getting the same um, scour extent downstream, but in terms of the overall depth of scour and shape, you know, generally I think it looks pretty good. So now on that right center gate, so this is the one, um, as I mentioned before, we think this one might be impacted by some mounding that went on downstream. So in our model, the plunge pool, you know, is symmetrical. There's no reason why our computed scour results would then also not really be symmetrical. So I think my guess is we're we're not quite capturing that hydraulic condition correctly on this side. And I think it's due to the mounding. Um, one of the things we wanted to look at further, I think it's just we didn't have a lot of time to look at it, was can we account for that and, and see what it looks like. But, but generally, I guess a one takeaway from this is the depth of scour in the vertical direction you know, we're, we're still getting that okay. It's just that longitudinal extent um, isn't quite matching. I think I hand it back to you, Eric, to talk about these outputs. Um, yeah, thank you. So just to show, show you on this, Dan, uh, a, um, a graphical output module that is currently under development uh, that will, will be available also for Rockscar and Remote Scar users where you can have here a perspective view and a plan view uh, through the iterations. If I launch the video, you can follow up during the runs what is happening uh, with with uh, the altitude and the, the scour formation uh, with all the necessary details. You can choose also the, the colors if you want, uh, and there are quite some options that will be available. Uh, the same can be done for any hydraulic parameter. We have the flow velocities here on the left-hand side. We have the RMS pressure fluctuations on the right-hand side through the different uh, iterations for, for a run here where you can follow up uh, what is happening in, in more detail. And if you take a longitudinal section, we have this here on the right-hand side and on the left-hand side, you can have here a flow velocity and underneath we have the initial bottom in brown and the observed scar bottom in black. We can also launch 
the computations, this was for a slightly different run than what Eric was been doing. So slightly different parametric uh, settings where we will see that there's something like 33 or 34 runs you have at each iteration, the details of the velocity, and you can see how uh, progressively we get to the end result. On the right-hand side, you can see we have some scar that was not on the prototype because we had those big boulders. Remember the first picture that we have some mounding here that is not uh, in the model today yet, not yet. And and we got here also, if you have seen it on the, the other side, uh, pretty good agreement also uh, of the, the observed scour. You can do that also in a transversal section, whatever kind of section or oblique sections that you can define, you can follow up what is happening. Uh, I take this one, Eric, or so maybe just to, to show you that were that was the result of the initial physical model modeling that was done for this dam, where you can see that we get a completely different shape uh, than what has been observed and that what, when what has been uh, um, obtained by the, the fluid solid uh, coupling. So we can say at least for this case here that this scenario, the the fluid solid coupling was closer to reality than what we got on the on the physical modeling. Of course, we can also go uh, further with this. Uh, again, this was not really a, a project that we did for a client. It's just a showcase. Or the, there are a lot of other parameters that can enter into play here, and that can, should be checked if that becomes an engineering uh, uh, project. Uh, Brian, the, a, few, a few of those questions that you've answered in the background, those watching on YouTube later on, uh, watching the recording, won't see those. So I just wanted to see if you wanted to highlight uh, some of those, um, uh, maybe maybe one or two of those questions that have come up, the ones that were most upvoted. Um, yeah, you know, in, in terms of the, some of the hydraulics questions, there was one um, just related to why do we want to do 3D modeling for rock scour applications? Um, you know, how is this different maybe from some conventional approaches? So you know, a lot of the you know, approaches are based on, you know, one day or two to, two D hydraulics. So we have significant vertical 3D components. Um, obviously these modeling tools could be uh, valuable in these types of situations. Um, uh, and then also there was a number of questions, uh, for, for Eric L, um, you know, getting to some of the details of the rock scour, um, coupling. So I think there was a you know, a few questions related to, you know, what types of validation data is out there. Um, some other questions related to, um, you know, how do we deal with some of the uncertainty of the inputs in terms of uh, patience uh, for that case with a one meter grid. And you saw, I think, the resolution of the flow, the details uh, are, are uh, sufficient for engineering applications. Uh, of course, you, you, you can go and, into uh, more details. You can take smaller... Uh, uh, grid sizes, but then uh, the computational time will become an issue, especially for 3D coupling. Or you can go to 2D coupling that you can do also. Say, okay, let's make it a 2D problem, take smaller grid sizes, and then you can better handle computational times. But generally, I would say we are within uh, half a meter to one meter grid sizes for most uh, projects and applications I've been doing is, is sufficient. Oh, great. And, uh, Stay tuned. We do have a Tailings Dam Breach webinar coming up where we will have some Flow 3D examples showing the layering and uh, for routing that downstream. Sometimes the um, sometimes the effect of that goes kilometers and kilometers downstream, and you're not going to want to do that in a CFD model, and so you'll need to couple at the boundary condition. Um, Eric L., any of those other questions from Brian that you wanted to uh, to highlight here? Uh, keeping in mind that what we'll do is take the written responses. Uh, we'll give a longer stab at the written responses, um, and we will provide those and a link to all of the Q&A um, that comes in as a PDF file um, it, that will be provided along with the YouTube uh, links um, in the description. So you'll see here, for those who do need to run on the hour, the um, a couple of links here. Um, and do fill out, again, as I mentioned, that survey to let us know uh, what you want to see more of. So what we'll have, uh, we'll have Eric L. Uh, address a couple more questions. We'll go back to Eric B. for uh, to continue those two examples. Um, if you want to see a couple of practical examples, just a few slides left um, for some extra bonus content beyond the hour time. So uh, back over to you, Eric L. Yeah, I guess um, one question that comes up is, so about the mesh 
Um, does the mesh change? Well, you can just scour and is the mesh structured or unstructured? So the mesh is, mesh is structured. Um, so to try to simply explain it, each mesh cell. So it, in Flow 3D, it's a process called favor. But basically, each cell is going to look at how much of that cell is it open to the fluid domain? Is it closed off by the solid? Or is it a con like somewhere in between? So the mesh is going to resolve that new 3D CAD component you bring in. And so I guess the, the mesh doesn't change. It's the way it resolves the 3D solid is what is changing each step. And so I guess back to the mesh um, resolution question. I mean, really, the as long as your mesh is capturing you know, the details of the geometry, like in this case, capturing the spillway, um, it's a good place to start. Um, obviously, like mesh sensitivity testing is always a great um, step to do in any type of modeling. Um, but yeah, I guess to try to explain how that works is, um, yeah, it's automatically going to pick up on that new 3D solid um, in the mesh. I think with a lot of these questions, um, you know, the responses to these are going to be a whole technical paper. And so what we'll do is include links to some resources um, on the, you know, Flow3D website and on in a couple of other places where there are papers written about some of these questions. Uh, some of them uh, can be answered pretty quickly. Some of them would require a dissertation to answer uh, just from what I can what I can see here. So, yeah, then um, I, we can see that example in the background. And if you wanted to um, highlight a couple of things about that and then we'll... Uh, yeah, get to the closing remarks. Okay, so let me quickly a few minutes to show you two other examples. Three bridge piers founded on rock in a river uh, with a sedimentary rock, uh, UCS string 20 megapascal, and uh, you can see the initial flow conditions with the contraction uh, generated of the flow generated by the piers, and then this will disappear when we have a scour of the bedrock. Uh, we will see here in the videos hydraulics on the left-hand side and in rock scour on the right-hand side, how progressively there is scour around the bridge piers and also in the wake of the turbulence generated by the piers towards downstream, we will see that the bedrock is uh, scouring progressively. You can see some iteration results. Uh, again, you can follow that up in detail uh, within rock scour immediately. And then the last example is uh, a case I will show you immediately where well, there's a lot of elements in here. There's a dam with a, a spillway crest giving an overflowing jet on an abutment. Uh, we have here a, a bottom outlet with a line stilling basin with baffle blocks and an, an end wall coming into a, an unlined a river channel on rock. And then we have some bridge piers here. If we put that in the hydraulics, first of all, you will see that, well, there is the jet uh, impacting. Uh, providing a flow that is also impacting on that bridge pier here where we will expect some scour. You have abutment flow here coming back to the centralized section and then you have the baffles that are not uh, sufficient and you still get a significant velocity downstream of your uh, stilling basin. And uh, you can see here in plan view we will have here the altitude during the iterations and on the right hand side the flow velocities where you can see that how progressively we get scour downstream of that stilling uh, basin. We get scour at the point of impact of the jet and in between the jet and uh, the dam, and we will get scour around the bridge pier. You will see in the wake the deviation, uh, and it starts over again. We, had, we get 15 iterations here. So you can follow that up in detail. The same for the stream power, for example. During those iterations, you have the stream power and the RMS dynamic pressure fluctuations. And finally, uh, you have an example here of a longitudinal section. We have the baffle blocks here, the end apron, and you get this car downstream of the concrete with the RMS uh, pressures at each iteration. You can follow that up. So these are two completely different situations just to show you how uh, that coupling works. So, which means that now we come to the conclusions. Uh, so I think it's important, uh, I will not enter into detail into all this, but simplified approaches for rock scour today are clearly not enough anymore. 2D or full 3D assessments are becoming, uh, the new standard today. Uh, it's important to get the details. Time dependency of scour formation also becomes more and more an issue. So we are not only looking at ultimate scour depth, we are looking now at 
the, the formation of scar as a function of time during flood events as to not get um, um, over predictions of scar mitigation and measures, for example. So digitalization of rock scar engineering uh, within this point of view becomes clearly inevitable. We, we have to go towards digitalization. And while the Rockscar family of platforms and modules offers you a new cutting edge technology of, of coupling and also learning abilities, there are uh, training courses that are available for people who want to take a subscription for Rockscar, for example, uh, the manuals and so on. And it's clear that the relevance, versatility and the ease of use of Flow 3D Hydro is a very, very powerful tool for any uh, turbulent flow situation that you want to couple uh, related to Rockscar. I would say also to finalize that there is a, a scientific handbook that I uh, wrote that came out uh, last month at uh, Taylor & Francis for people that are interested uh, to purchase that, uh, that book. They can contact me also uh, directly. So where you get even more information on both the theory, the digitalization processes, uh, digital twins, and the 2D and 3D uh, coupling that from which you saw some examples today. Wow. Well, thanks for, man, you've plowed through those examples. That was awesome. A lot of links coming up in the chat line, which we will also paste into the description on the YouTube channel. Uh, thanks everyone for your participation. We will um, let you all have some closing remarks. Um, uh, my my thing that I learned today of everything um, uh, technical is that the, uh, the at symbol there, which you may think is an A inside of an E, which I think each at was the original purpose um, hundreds of years ago when it was developed, uh, in this case, is actually an O and a U where the U circles it. So you actually can't pronounce this as rock scour. So I did learn that today. That's something new. Um, let's have everybody do some closing remarks. Um, what we'll do then is, uh, yeah, just go back through the order. Um, Brian, if you just want to close up with anything you wanted to mention about the Q&A, um, what we might provide people in terms of resources, um, and then uh, over to Eric L, and then we'll have Eric B uh, wrap it up. Um, yeah, fantastic questions. I've been seriously typing away uh, to answer those. And uh, for those that we didn't answer, we'll uh, take a look and we'll uh, get back to you on this. All right. Perfect. Eric L., any closing remarks? Yeah, no, thanks. Uh, thanks to Eric and Brian for taking um, some non work hour time to, to attend. But no, the questions are very good. Um, you know, very, um, yeah, I guess we'll we'll get back to those in detail, like Brian said. And yeah, thanks for taking the time to attend. These are great webinars. Yeah, and Eric L., thanks for all the promotional giveaways. We were promoting the Australia Water School courses last week at the um, uh, Floodplain Management Australia conference. So if you're walking around Australia, there's going to be a whole bunch of people uh, walking around with billboards on their shirt. We've got Flow 3D shirts and Flow 3D hats. Um, they all, I think, every one of them disappeared. So those will be floating around. If you happen to see somebody walking around with one, we are the Australian Water School, so you'll see some of those in Australia. But you saw today, this is a global audience that we reach with these uh, topics um, by no means limited to Australia. Thanks for providing an Australian example, though, for us here. Uh, but these there are worldwide applications of this, and we will see more and more of this as software and hardware um, advances continue. Um, Eric B., bring it home for us. Uh, any closing remarks before we close it up? For yeah, so some very interesting uh, questions on, on the rock scour part and the quality of the rock. And so uh, I will take some time to, uh, to answer all of these questions. And I hope today, while well, we were able to trigger some of your interest in in, in the digital rock scour. So, excellent. Thank well, thanks uh, to Flow 3D and Rock Scour, well, through AquaVision for sponsoring today's webinar. I hope we brought you some valuable content. Um, do let us know what you want to see more of next. It's amazing to see, you know, 10 years ago, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing today couldn't have been done. So, where are we going to be tw uh, 10 years from now? Um, this is, uh, it's very exciting. Uh, this is cutting edge, what you see today. And we want to bring you the best content we can here with the Australian Water School. So let us know what you want to see more of. Thanks a lot for attending today. Thanks to the presenters for uh, attending at all wee hours of the evening and the night. Um, thanks so much to uh, everybody for participating and making this uh, webinar happen today. We'll see you next time with the Australian Water School.